good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World First Council of Philadelphia. Uh, I'll start with our obligatory announcement. If you haven't already done so, please silence uh, your electronic devices uh, so that we can all uh, stay focused on uh, our discussion uh, today. Uh, however, we do encourage you to join uh, this conversation on Twitter uh, by tweeting about today's program using at WAPDILA. And, and we also always invite you to like the World First Council on Facebook if you haven't already done so. We're now approaching 1,100 uh, likes, which is really uh, quite something for an organization of our size. Um, we're glad to have all of you joining us here uh, for this last event uh, of uh, the calendar year before we take our break uh, for the holiday season. And we're going to have two, as you know, significant discussions for you uh, today focusing on the continent of Africa. Africa. Um, most Americans, if you look at polling data, think that it's a country, uh, not a continent, uh, of immense vitality and diversity, 54 countries actually. Uh, there are images of wild animals and images of starving children uh, that are often the mainstays of uh, what little media coverage there is of Africa. And our national attention tends to turn to the continent almost only in a time of crisis. And that has included during administrations of both parties. Uh, but today there is sweeping change in Africa, both uh, above the Sahara uh, and below it. Uh, with world-shaping events that are playing out there. And we will try to evaluate at least some of these issues this afternoon. Our first discussion is titled Tunisia and Post-Arab Spring Success. It's nice to have a program these days where we can put the word success uh, in the title. Uh, featuring Jerry Sorkin, a uh, specialist uh, in the Middle East and North African politics and tourism. Uh, Jerry resides most of the year in Tunisia his involvement with that country dates back more than three decades. During these last three years, since Tunisia's January 2011 revolution, uh, he served as a consultant for the World Bank and was among the authors uh, of that institution's 2012 report uh, on restructuring the tourism economy of Tunisia. I should also note uh, that Jerry has a long time uh, maybe even close to a lifetime, uh, involved uh, with us at the World First Council of Philadelphia. Uh, when he was at Penn, uh, he served as a volunteer in organizing and participating in some of our model UN and Mideast Peace Conference programs with students uh, in various uh, schools throughout the Philadelphia area. So his friendship and his hands-on involvement with the council has been lengthy. Uh, and this upcoming year, uh, as many of you may have seen at this point, Jerry and I uh, will be leading a tour to Tunisia in March. So please join me in welcoming Jerry uh, Sorkin. So we're going to do this uh, conversation style. Um, and uh, we can use the mic or, or not at your front. Okay. Grab the other one. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to start with a uh, with, uh, real softball. Um, what caused the 2011 uprising in Tunisia? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, this one? Yeah, no. Okay, it's a very good question. There, no, no political pundit speaking on or on. It's not on. Okay. Well, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say no political pundit. No political pundit speaking candidly uh, could give a reason. No one could have predicted Tunisia's revolution. It came out of nowhere. It was a leaderless uh, revolution. By that I mean there wasn't some figurehead who had been part of an independence movement, as often happens during revolutions. It really was a very spontaneous situation. Uh, I was there during that, that period, and no one could have predicted it. Uh, for 23 years prior, there had been a an autocratic dictator, Ziyabedin Ben Ali, uh, who had been ruling Tunisia, and I would say in some ways, one might say he had been somewhat of a benign dictator. If you stayed out of politics, if you didn't talk about the corruption of his family, um, and you didn't want to raise some issues about having greater rights in the press, life could be pretty good. 
but there was a, a glaring corruption coming from his family, and uh, an incident uh, happened uh, in December 2010, which uh, sparked a fruit vendor, a vegetable vendor in a small town in the central part of Tunisia to kind of burn himself out of uh, frustration. And that's really set the spark. And uh, the, the re real change came was when President Ben Ali fled the country on January 14th. No, I mean, unlike what we saw with Mubarak and Assad and some of the in Gaddafi, Ali, Ben Ali just left. And suddenly there was this revolution that was taking place. And that's, so it's a situation where it happened, no one could have predicted it. And then the question really is, what is a revolution? How does it evolve? And that's, I think, a little bit what we can touch on. Uh, So, uh, as you as you've already said, and we're going to we're going to delve into this, um, the premise of our program today uh, uh, is that Tunisia is in better shape today uh, than uh, some of the other countries that have that have gone through uh, in various forms what people call the Arab Spring. Uh, certainly, uh, compared to Libya, compared to Egypt, uh, and and uh, Lord knows compared to Syria. Um, if you can boil down what you believe the factors are that set Tunisia apart uh, and, are, and uh, are providing uh, the basis for this greater degree of successful transformation. Uh, well, it's interesting. Tunisia, when this revolution started, it wasn't to inspire anyone else. Subsequently, uh, you know, weeks later, we had in Tahrir Square in Cairo, Egyptians protesting. Shortly thereafter, you had the same thing in Syria, you had in Bahrain, you had in Libya. So there was this rolling, which I would say the media dubbed the Arab Spring. But it was nothing that anyone in Tunisia said, oh, we want to inspire other Arab countries. It was really their own revolution. Um, and, and, and as I say, it was leaderless. So for the first three months, interesting enough, Tunisia would have all these people camped at the, at the Kasbah, the prime minister's palace. But utilities were working, schools were working. There was, you know, a little chaos because people had, who had not had the ability to strike as frequently under Ben Ali, garbage workers, nurses, policemen, <coughs> were taking advantage of the, la the lack of authority. But things tended to work, and life tended to go on, and, you know, no one was really in authority. But it was, it, again, it was leaderless, and it's, it tended to move on its own. And I would say that one glaring point that separates and it's Craig's point of what allowed Tunisia to do this. Tunisia is an educated populace, and they had systems in place. So you had ministries that functioned, other, unlike somewhere like Libya, where Gaddafi really controlled everything. You, you, you have institutions in Libya, but in the end, it's what Gaddafi decided that morning to do. That's what ruled. But Tunisia had functioning institutions in terms of education, in terms of Ministry of Defense, security, all these areas. And, and they were able to continue working. So it, it made the revolution, I would say, a fluid process, which no one knew where exactly where it was going. But it was not a process of chaos. Though I sometimes hear from the media, you would hear, you know, it's crazy over there. But over there normally meant that whole region. People, and Tunisia has always suffered from this being one of a broad brush stroke of how Americans, how we and the media and Americans in general look at the Arab and Islamic world. It's, it's over there. They're rioting. They're in chaos. But Tunisia, I would say, while you know, there were these strikes and graffiti came, which never came before, trash pickup wasn't regular, the, the going on of day-to-day -day semblance and orderliness was pretty, pretty orderly, considering it was a revolution. Uh, so there have been parliamentary elections in October uh, and uh, presidential elections uh, on uh, November 13th. Uh, can you tell us uh, sort of your reflections on the outcome of the elections um, and perhaps the, the, the differences between the parliamentary and presidential results? Well, just to, to give them a little bit of a background, let me, let me uh, explain how the uh, election system really uh, worked and the political system developed during this period from January 2011. Um, <clears throat> there were elections under Ben Ali over the years he was in power, but they were sham elections. You know, people would 
have big parades and uh, you know he would win with 99 percent of the vote or if they wanted to show that uh, it was more real they say this year he only got 92 percent of the vote um, <clears throat> but what one of the first things that was planned after january 2011 when there was a prime minister put in place in an interim position whose name is Beji Kaid Sepsi. He's about 88 years old, and I, I mention his name because we're going to hear it in the coming weeks. He was from the Bourguiba era, Bourguiba being the founder of Tunisia's independence movement. He had been retired. He had been asked to come out of retirement. He's a man who was considered of clean hands. He had been out of politics. And he came to the Kasbah March 2011, three months after the revolution, and kind of said to everyone in this you know, man of stature, it's time to go, to leave the Kasbah, go back to work. We have to put our country in order. And he, he received the recognition of people in doing that. That was a very, very important step, that people saw there was a figurehead, not a figurehead in a political sense, but he brought back a little bit of the Bourguiba, uh, you know, the reason, the raison d'etre of Tunisia being, uh, it's a country that's independent. Where change really came is because you had this revolution, and for so many years, people who had been part of the Islamic movement had been uh, imprisoned under Ben Ali, a new revolution had to open up the doors to everyone. So people were, 11,000 people were let out of prison, which included criminals as well as Islamists. Uh, one of the things that Ben Ali used to always say to the United States, when we as a government or the Europeans would push him to open up more freedom, he would say, you know, our keeping these Islamists in check are, were really the bulwark against uh, Islamic terrorism coming to the West. And, and we're now seeing there perhaps was some reality to that. But what happened in, with this opening of the prisons, you suddenly had Islamic leaders coming back from who had been away in England for 12 years, particularly the Islamic Brotherhood, which in the Tunisian Brotherhood group is called Inada, led by Rashid Ghanoushi. And this started to change the dynamics. Ganushi was received, he's about 75 years old, he's a Sorbonne uh, educated uh, philosopher uh, and uh, considered a, a theorist in Islam. And he had quite a following. It was almost as though, if you remember the days, for those of you who are old enough, in 1979 when Khomeini came back from, from Paris, he was revealed by many people who, who felt this religion and this stature of a religious authority would, would really bring something good. So, Ganushi and the Islamic Brotherhood really took hold of things. But this caused a problem for all the 20 and 30-somethings who really were part of the revolution. They're saying, you're hijacking this revolution. What, this was not about revolution. This was not about religion, I'm sorry. This was about finding our dignity, uh, ha having our rights as 20, 30-somethings who have college educations. Tunisia is a very literate society, about 90% literacy. So suddenly you had a new dynamic. You had the youth who see themselves as the ones who helped make this momentum of the, re of the revolution happen. And then you have suddenly this religious party that's saying, we're going to guide you in the direction. And this became part of the political process. The Islamists, under the, under the, not the party, versus those who were the seculars. And in between that you have kind of the communist, uh, the, the, I would say the avowed anti-secularist, but not necessarily the secular party. And if I now fast forward to 10 months after the revolution to October 2011, there was an election. And it was transparent, it was the first free election in Tunisia, by all standards it was free. And the Islam Islamic party won the plurality. Not necessarily the majority, but the plurality. And their charge was that for what they were to have for one year to be a provisional government, to develop a constitution for Tunisia, and then call for elections, which would then lead to a five-year type of election that you find in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> in doing so, it, it showed a, a real political maturity, the fact that this election took place freely, the fact that now the one, uh, uh, the plurality, but the problem is, as the uh, cycle of what was to be one year took place, we were seeing in Tunisia a little bit of what happened with Morsi when he became elected. Suddenly, the, 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 the democracy was no longer so democratic. And some people would say, we're certainly seeing that with Putin today, 
uh, and Mubarak, uh, I'm sorry, and Sisi in Egypt, and, and Erdogan in Turkey. Democracy gets them to a certain point, but then they start pulling back the reins of the democratic process and tightening the reins. And uh, this is what we've been seeing for the last three years. So what was to be a one-year charge of a, of a constitution being developed became almost three years. The reason it was constantly being injected by the Islamic Party with clauses that that really de detour detoured the process. I'll give you one glaring example. Um, in uh, 2013, there was a strong push for about six months from members of the Constituent Assembly, the elected body, which, as I say, is already over a year over their basis, their 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 uh, mandate. They were trying to make a law in Tunisia as part of the new constitution that women would be complementary to men. Now, anywhere in the Arab world, this would perhaps have been seen as somewhat progressive. But in Tunisia, which from 1956 had what was called under Bourguiba the personal status law where women and men were completely equal, this was a setback, a glaring setback. But the Islamic Party tried to put this in, and, and it was these type of things that would constantly detour the process of six months. Uh, so the process of the real democratization became two years, three years, and then that it brought us up to, uh, to August 2013, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit. Uh, Craig, I don't know if you want to add anything at this point to it, but... No, I, I, please, uh, okay. if you can just kind of take us through okay. the three years, I think. So, so we were seeing this process going, uh, Politically, things were there was stability. Now and then, there were a couple assassinations, but by and large, Tunisia was stable. Uh, there were a couple things that, that were also seen. Security was a bit lapsed. Uh, the uh, Islamic Party had the, the main portfolios because they had the plurality. They staffed the Ministry of Defense. They staffed the Ministry of Interior. They staffed the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and everyone was seeing that as much as at the beginning people thought, oh, this religious party, they're going to be pure, that they were as corrupt and, um, you know, as, as problematic as any party. And, it, and the country was facing a certain frustration because this constitution wasn't getting done, it kept getting postponed, people knew security were lap, was lapsed, uh, and being that these prime ministries were under the guidance of the Islamic party, who yet usually put people in power, who were not qualified, their only qualification is they did 12 years in prison uh, as an Islamic prisoner, so this was their reward. So the process really became a stalemate. And in August 2013, this gentleman I mentioned who was 80 years old, Beji Kaid Epsepsi, who is now back out of the picture, he had formed an umbrella secular group, if you like to call it, called Nida Tunis, which means call of Tunis. And people in Parliament said, enough with the Islamic Party. They've accomplished nothing. It's been your, your th almost three years past your, your due date. Uh, we've got to go somewhere. And, and this is a, a step then took place that I would say, again, showed a real political maturity. Uh, Beji Kaid Sepsi uh, offered to meet with Ganushi in Paris in August 2013. And this is having two people who definitely hate each other and represent two very different things. But they decided to meet on the neutral territory of Paris and hammer out and say, how are we going to get past this? And this was, uh, I have to say, from both sides, they both made bitter compromises that were very tough. Um, again, this shows a political maturity which we haven't seen in any of these so-called Arab Spring countries. And I think, again, this uh, the, the media in Tunisia is very free now. So every night on the talk shows, people talk about what's going on. Charlie Rose is, is amphitheon item, you know, in, there's 12 Charlie Roses on TV every night. Uh, so, in August 2013, they had this sit down, and the decision finally was that everyone who was not from the Islamic Party basically said to the Islamic Party, we're going to boycott the, the parliament. We're not coming back until you, the Islamic Party, agree that we're going to appoint technocrats into a provisional government, we're going to finally get this darn constitution done, and you're going to step back from your positions. This was a bitter pill for the Islamics to accept, but they realized they had no choice, and they accepted to do that. 
So January, the end of 2013, they resigned. January 2014, which is not too long ago, we're not even there a year, a technocratic government was placed in power, really with unknown people, but good. And we have seen in this last year a process that did just what was hoped. The technocratic prime minister, whose name is Mehdi Joma, he was a, a rather successful uh, engineer in France who came back to Tunisia. He led the process through the Constitution. The Constitution was, I would say, a very progressive Constitution with compromises that was ultimately voted on. And it was quite an amazing scene to see on television. I think there's 217 people in the parliament. 208 of the people, were, 208 ratified them. Ratified it. And that night on television, they were showing the counting of every member of parliament. And when this ratification came, everyone stood up <coughs> at one time with the, Tunisian, <laughs> with the Tunisian flag and started singing the national anthem. And it was really, what it showed is something that hasn't happened in many of these other countries. That the nationalism, the, the Tunisian-ness, is really came out in Tunisia. And, and we're seeing that now. And this election that, that um, uh, Craig just mentioned that took place in October was for the new parliament for five, for five years. It was, again, transparent and free. And what was very interesting uh, was... On November 23rd, Carlotta, if any of you re re regularly read the New York Times, Carlotta Gall is a regular writer uh, who often covers Afghanistan and Pakistan. And in the last num number of months, she's been based in North Africa. And November 23rd, she said, the Islamic party is poised for a big win. I don't know what Kool-Aid she was drinking, <laughs> but it turned out not to be the case. And the Islamic party took a, a rather humbling loss not a dramatic loss, but considering they thought it would. So that was just in October. So it means this new parliament is not a majority Islamic. It's a majority uh, secular, a mix of secular groups, which they now have to do the balancing of farming parties and coalitions. And what we had just two Sundays ago that Craig mentioned was now the president. It's much like the French system. You first have the parliamentary vote, which is now established. Now there will be the, the there was the vote for the the president and Beijing Kai Tsepsi, this 88 year old gentleman, uh, was first in place, and the second in place is the person who is now the provisional government president. And his name is uh, Marzuki, Mosa Marzuki. They will have a runoff at the end of this month, because uh, under the the system, much like the French, the top two people have a runoff, and this one has a clear majority. And Tunisia really will have achieved something by the end of this this month that is uh, unlike anywhere else in the Arab world. It's a true democracy that's been transparent. The problems are not gone. You still have economic problems that are severe. Um, during the years of the revolution, foreign investment left. Uh, there were security lapses which, which have been worked on considerably in the last year. Uh, there's tremendous support from the United States and the European countries behind Tunisia, which is which I could say is, uh, I, I, I'm quite w well aware of that, what that support takes in terms of it, its, its process. And it's, uh, the U.S. is really behind seeing this happen. So it may be, I think we can say safely, it's going to be the first true Arab democracy. And it's working. And Tunisian friends will say to me, you know, Jerry, they're, you know, watch this guy on TV, he's always yelling every night. And I said, you know, go to Washington and watch the Republicans and the Democrats who have not been able to resolve things. I, I think Tunisia has, has been coming a long way. So that's a quick, uh, uh, a quick political wrap-up of, of where Tunisia stands politically now. And now it's a question of um, the, the victors uh, ha are going to have, just like any election, whether the United States, people are going to say, okay, now you're you had a platform for jobs. How is that going to take place? How are we going to bring back foreign investment? How are we going to bring back tourism? And that's the mandate that Tunisia has to look for now. And that's some of the, for those who join us in, in, in March, you're going to have a real inside look at these personalities who've been involved. And I think that's what makes it fascinating. Tunisia's the type of place where six degrees of separation is very easy to, to reach. And th th again, this was leaderless. So it's not that there's some superhero who, who took it above himself to, to do it. People have been involved in all areas, civil society, meaning small NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, people on the ground who've decided to farm organizations to move forward 
it's, it's really, to me, a dynamic process to see taking place. And we in the United States often hear these buzzwords about NGOs, uh, civil society, but Tunisia is really going through it in a, in a very special way. So that's uh, probably the, the fastest roundup I could ever give on the political cycle of Tunisia. Thank you. So we, we held a program uh, a couple of months ago uh, about American politics. Uh, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to hold the program in Congress Hall, a uh, very historic building. And, and one of the things that we talked about was the, uh, the very important uh, kind of transformational moment in American history uh, when uh, George Washington voluntarily surrendered the presidency uh, to John Adams. Uh, You've just described a, a, a voluntary transfer of power, which is very rare uh, in, in the world in general, and certainly uh, in, the, in the Arab world. I want, I want you to go back and, as an observer, uh, sort of an anthropological observer and so on, of, of this country and this culture, what are the factors uh, to which you attribute this uh, willingness uh, to engage in what we would consider genuine democratic practices? Uh. <coughs> I think the fact that Tunisia, Tunisia is 10 and a half million people. And as I say, it's kind of six degrees of separation. It doesn't take long before you know someone who knows someone who knows someone. <laughs> so you have people in every family. Someone has someone who perhaps has leanings with the Islamic party. But in every family, you have people who have other leanings. And I, and I do b really believe that the, the fact that in Tunisia, you don't have all the different ethnic groups that you have in Syria. Uh, or Libya, or where you have tribal groups. So there's a, a rather homogeneous society. Uh, most people are, 99% of the people are Muslim. They're, uh, they are from the Malachi sect, which is a, a, a more progressive, open-minded sect of Islam. So religion is really not so much an issue. The only people who made religion an issue was the Islamic party who tried to instill it into their political process. But what the last election showed was People weren't voting. You had people with head, with headscarves who, who come out who came out on voting day showing their purple thumb with the ink, and I would ask them who did you vote for, and they'd say Beji, meaning uh, the, the the secular 88, 88 year old guy. That same person three years ago may have voted for the Islamic Party, but they saw the Islamic Party didn't accomplish anything for them. So this time they're saying I'm voting for what I think is best for Tunisia. So I think that that's a very important thing. I, I think also the parties, since they do talk to each other, they've recognized that they have to talk. Now there is the coalition building. Who's going to do it? And even I had, uh, the, I've been back here a week in Philadelphia. The week before I came, I spoke with a very high advisor of uh, uh, the, the Nida Tunis, the secular umbrella group. And I said to him, Salah, who, who is going to, you just won, but, but somehow, you are in a situation with the Islamic party, you can either make them feel they're the loser and push them aside, or you can bring them into somehow the fold and incorporate them. What's the strategy here? And then you have these other little parties who each want something, none in their own have power. How do you deal with this coalition building? And it was very interesting what he said. Uh, and I think this is kind of a, 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 gives us a little bit of a direction of how Tunisian thinking is going in terms of trying to be Tunisian rather than party affiliated. He said to me, um, the internal talk is that as much as some of them, the stink of the Islamic party is very strong, it's better to have your enemies within and give them some posts, some, some positions, and have them part of it, than leave them out and push them out of the system where they can do more damage. And I thought that was, again, a very uh, mature philosophy as far as how to build build bridges in a country that, that needs to build bridges. You, you can't have fifth columns there uh, trying to uh, undermine every effort. And it's the same with all these little uh, secular parties that want the communists and some of the, the other, and there's a party that's led by a, a multimillionaire soccer uh, owner who no one knows where his money came from, but he uh, has risen, uh, he's young and youthful and, and rich uh, so someone has to deal with all these parties, but I, I, I believe there's just, I, I boil it down to the educational factor, the fact that there truly is freedom to talk, freedom to do whatever you want now in Tunisia. Sometimes that's abused, but um, 
abused not in, 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 the, in the sense that it shouldn't be done, but that doesn't mean now you can make graffiti whereas before you didn't. Uh, so I, I would say that this maturity of being able to speak freely, uh, have a, a direct dialogue, and work out what is best for Tunisia is taking place, and I don't think it can happen, or certainly we haven't seen that it is happening anywhere else in the Arab world because I think the, the mixture of ethnic groups in other countries, the, the dogmatism of some of the leaders to let go and to recognize that they can't hold power. Um, and I think Tunisia we're truly is this unique country. And it's always suffered from this. You know, uh, We talk about Africa today on the program. Tunisia is African, it's Arab, it's Muslim. And if you ask someone what they are, and I just had the situation, I gave a lecture to a, a class a few weeks ago in Tunisia, and there were maybe 30 people out there, and I said to them, if you had to identify yourself, are you first Muslim, are you Arab, or are you Tunisian? Every hand went up and said Tunisian. And I think that's, that's an example of how they think. So we're seeing this now play out. Tunisia is a small country. It's not really very well known in this country. It's not a powerhouse of trade. It's always suffered from kind of being um, under the, you know, the, the it's, it's suffered in the sense that it has borne the wrath of being associated with all the other Arab countries, perhaps. But now it's per having its chance to stand alone, and uh, I hope that uh, it will continue to get the support that it seems to be getting from the U.S. and from the European Union, uh, both of whom are uh, totally behind Tunisia, but Tunisia also has to act on its own, but there's a lot of very bright minds, and I think that's going to that's gonna really be what leads the way. Uh, last question before we uh, open to the audience. Uh, we've both uh, mentioned uh, the, the trip that uh, the council is planning uh, in March. Can, can you just talk a little bit about the, some of the content, what, what kind of access you think we're going to be able to have? Uh, this is a trip that we're purposely keeping to about a week so people can stay extra in it because Tunisia has, is filled with historical sites and uh, many cultural things. Uh, but the trip will, will have culture embedded throughout because you'll be meeting people throughout. But uh, Craig and I felt that it would really be special to concentrate on this rare opportunity for people to have an insider look. I mean, this, this is really what World Affairs Council is about. It's nonpartisan uh, policy forum. So to be able to have and sit down and have a meeting with someone who is from the Islamic party or from who's with civil society who founded an NGO or someone who's from the, the uh, secular party, this is a lot of the type of encounters we'll have. Uh, sometimes it'll be in a nice restaurant, sometimes it'll be in a nice venue. But it'll be a lot of this personal talking, very candid, a rare, really a, a rare inside view. We're also going to have a, a briefing, of course, from someone from the U.S. Embassy. But you'll really have an inside glimpse as to, I mean, what is a revolution? How many of us in our university years studied revolutions? And there is no one uh, template for what makes a revolution. So, you know, I, I look at it and I say, I've been living through a revolution, but the, it's not been horrific. It's not the revolution someone in Libya has lived through, or it's not what Syrians are going through. But you will have this opportunity to, to meet people, in many cases your peers, people who, uh, you know, same profession, same age, but uh, now they also have a, a political acumen that they're able to put forth. So it's a trip that really will have a lot of this infused with uh, staying in a wonderful resort hotel, eating in some great places, seeing some historical sites, and. Uh, it's really a very people people tour. That's that's really it. That's really what it is. And at least eleven out of the twelve Charlie Roses, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to open it to to, to uh, your questions, please, sir. How do you describe the uh, strength of the institutions that you mentioned early in the talk? Did everyone hear the question. What do you what do I describe the strength of the institutions to that I had ref referenced earlier? Um, one of the things that I would say has been uh, a legacy ever since Tunisia's independence in 1950s, 56 under Bourguiba, and then subsequently carried on with Ben Ali, is in, in the 1956-63 period when the Arab world was going through national, Arab nationalism. You had Egypt uh, going through their process in Syria, and, and then the French in Morocco and Algerian French and, and Tunisia. Most countries wanted to throw off the yoke of any 
protectorate, any past colonial aspect. Bourguiba was a secular trained lawyer, and he his answer when there was this peaceful, rather peaceful transition of power from t French, fr the French ruling Tunisia to Tunisia being independent, he said, let's not throw all the things away. Let's preserve the educational system. Let's preserve the health system. Let's preserve the ministries that the French set up. And the French, what the French did in Tunisia is not necessarily what the French did in Algeria. In, in Algeria, they really took Algeria as a, as a part of France. In Tunisia, under the French, they used, they, they incorporated the Tunisians to run many of their ministries. So the systems that the French set up were, were there, and Bourguiba had the vision to say, we can't start, the, we can't rebuild our new country from scratch. We have to preserve some of these institutions. And I would say it's the perpetuation of that over the years that has allowed it. And again, um, one of the main goals under Bourguiba was education and healthcare. So education and healthcare from the very early days, combined with the fact that you had institutions, has allowed the country to mature in a way where there's this, an assemblance of order that has allowed it to ride these highs and lows. So. Please. Why would you guess Turkey has moved in exactly the opposite direction of Tunisia? I think the only one who can answer that is Erdogan. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a parallel taking place with er Erdogan and Putin. And sometimes it's just a question of when someone gets enough power. I mean, Erdogan, what he did economically for Turkey was dramatic. He was able to bring this country that had rampant inflation, had many problems, and he was able to, in his early years uh, as prime minister, bring it to a point where he was able to resolve many of those problems. And this also helped to give a new place in society to the, to the what I would say, the, the middle class Turks, often who are more uh, grounded in being observant. So they now had a new inheritance, and they had this uh, Erdogan who has led them, they're no longer dominated by the wealthy Istanbul, Istanbulis who have all the money, but they're developing their own economic clout. And I think over time, uh, he saw that this would also gave him a, a strength that I would say is similar to what Putin is seeing. Uh, it's, there's no justification for it. I think it's just they're pushing the envelope as far as they can. And, um, you know, we see just a, a month ago Erdogan moved into this, you know, massive palace in Turkey. I'm sure there's a lot of people in Turkey wondering this was not part of our agenda. So I think the only people who could really answer that, I think, it, are them. And I think it's because they developed enough economic clout that they felt they had the the ability to, to challenge and, and take these things on, whether they'll remain successful in pushing these agendas, we'll have to wait and see. Please, sir. Yes. Um, um, ben Ali, um, was he reading the tea leaves because for a leader with that much power to just evaporate, uh, he must have been sensing something. And then the next part of the question is, where is he and his family and are they uh, involved at any level in what's happening uh, in Tunisia? And is there any uh, effort to include him? Uh, did we, did we, can you sort of summarize yeah, that? Yes, the question was, Ben Ali, the leader who I said left in January 2011, wh where is he, was he reading the tea leaves in the sense that he was seeing that there's something happening? Wh where is he now? Where is his family? And, and is there any attempt to bring him in? Um, he, he had advisors who were telling him, because I know some, telling him, you got to loosen up. That there's a low simmer, simmering flame there that all it takes is something to happen and maybe it'll spark. But his biggest problem was he was surrounded by his wife's family who were as corrupt as can be, who used to be peddlers in the market but became phenomenal, phenomenally wealthy and had a piece of every contract that took place. And I think they were so corrupted by money, and people say he was becoming uh, a little bit ill on his own, and his wife was really, people who know him, that his wife was really running. I think he just saw this was an opportunity to take his ill-gotten gains and leave. And it was really nothing more than that. Uh, he's in Saudi Arabia. Um, he has made no public comments, no interviews. I'm sure that's partly an arrangement with the Saudis because he probably has a lot of dirt on them. 
and probably he's told, you know, you can come, bring all the money you want, but don't get involved with politics. So there's no um, talking of bringing him back. Interesting enough, over the last couple of years, because uh, Tunisia has, it used to be that you'd see the country, and it was, everything was painted white, the streets were clean. Now, unfortunately, you see graffiti, you see trash, and people will often say, you know, it'd be nice to have the old times. They, they don't mean Ben Ali the man, but they meant they mean their structure. So. I think that the Saudis have sort of like a retirement home for dictators, <laughs> and Idi Amin moves out. And so. Okay, we're gonna go to, towards the back. Yes, sir. Um, my question, with the exception of Tunisia, um, look, well, that have made a lot of tremendous changes in adopting democratic principles in the political system. Um, are you positive about the future of the Middle East, especially countries like Libya, um, Egypt, and um, um, Syria? That has made that tremendous like they have led into the part of the fair state right now. So, are you positive about the future of those countries for the Middle East? Right, the question was. Uh, given the, the, the positive aspects I mentioned about Tunisia, do I feel positive about what, what might be uh, optimistic about the other countries in the region? Yeah. And my answer is no. <laughs> I, I think this is the biggest threat that faces Tunisia. There are a lot of countries that don't want to see uh, Tunisia be successful. Tunisia's greatest challenge right now is in protecting its security from, you know, you have ISIS who keeps who's moving along. You have people in Libya, no one knows who's in power in Libya, but there's a lot of arms. Um, what's going on in the Syrian-Turkish border, we have no idea who's in charge, the power that, that's moving. So I am not overly optimistic about stability in that region, uh, and I think that is the biggest concern that Tunisia faces, and I, I can certainly tell you the Europeans and the Americans are, are very much aware of this, and they're putting a lot of effort now into North Africa in terms of security measures, which was an area that had been fairly neglected. But they realize this is an area they have to really protect, otherwise a domino effect will only uh, continue. So I'm sorry to not give a, a happy picture on that. Sorry, please. Uh, yeah. I've heard two theories as to why Tunisia is not going to be I won't repeat the whole question, and hopefully people heard it. I, I would say we, we really, um, I'm sure we as the United States uh, will be puzzling for years whether we went into Iraq for the right reasons, and I think there's already been enough that has said it wasn't for the right reasons. One of the things, and Craig and I were talking about it a little before tonight, the U.S. really gave Iraq almost a template of, of how to develop a good system, but the, I think the ethnic strife, the corruption within, the um, many things just did not allow it to take root. So even though they were, they were almost given a template and the support of the U.S. and others who said, we broke it, so we're going to now try and fix it. Let's try and make it work. It, it hasn't really happened. Um, maybe because Tunisia has ha happened on its own and is isolated, it's seeing more of a success. But um, I, I don't think we can look at any of these other regions as, uh, and I think each of them has had their own problem. I, I don't know that we can look at Iraq as, own, as any kind of comparison, what the initial things were, why it's not working, and what's happening. Oh, I just meant to talk about this course, not yes. necessarily about the Iraq project, but just how it affected broader conversation. I, I, don't, I don't know that it has had a great time. I, I really don't. I, I think we've learned lessons from it, but I don't think there's a discourse that's giving us guidance of how to do it better. That's, that's my opinion. Okay, we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to come over here to one of our students. 
Did she? Um, what would the Tunisian military, what role did the Tunisian military play in the revolution? It's a very good question. What was the role of the Tunisian military? Uh, and it ties in with the president's departure. The Tunisian military is only about 50,000 people. And it's never been a military that was offensive. It was basically a border army. It's never had tactical training, really, of any substance. It's uh, never did I used to see weapon, you know, airplanes, pi uh, helicopters. It's really a very um, modest army compared to Egypt, where when after the revolution in Tunisia, we saw the important role that the army did play when Mubarak tried to save himself and not leave in Egypt. The Egyptian army is, is extremely strong. The Egyptian army is, and the officers involved are very much embedded in the fiscal world as they retire and they move on. They have all types of industries that are spawned from the military. Tunisia has none of that. So the Tunisian military was really seen by Tunisians as with great pride because these were simple soldiers who did not take sides, they were objective. Um, they facilitated when it was found that Ben Ali was trying to leave. They let him leave, but some of the military took his his gold and things and did not. They said at the airport there were a couple people who said, "Okay, you're leaving, but we're not. You're not taking these things with you." So they were thought of as really showing again this Tunisian nationalist. Even today, um, the Tunisian military is rather weak. They're getting. Uh, a lot of training from, again, the Europeans and the Americans and a little bit from Algeria um, in, in trying to face the challenges they have. IEDs, things that were taking place in Iraq and Afghanistan Syria, or were unheard of in Tunisia. Tunisia has never had to worry about terrorist attacks. Now they're, how, now they're learning how to combat this. They're, they've always had a good um, security system because under Ben Ali, security was very important in terms of intelligence but they're now having to enact it to protect the borders and protect within to make sure that, um, uh, that security is not uh, abused. So it plays a minor role, but it's having to do with a very fast learning curve right now. Uh, Jerry, what would, you have, what would you say to a, uh, someone who's considering visiting to the <laughs> Okay. The question was about security. What what would I advise someone who's considering coming? Uh, with given the comments I made about the advance of ISIS in the re in the Middle East, North Africa, uh, how do I feel about security in Tunis versus outlying areas? And I would say that Tunisia is really quite very safe. Everywhere you go, you find. Um, I mean, there was a period under the Islamic Party where uh, it was not as rigorous, but that's been changed considerably. Uh, there were approaches that were always used during Ben Ali that have now been brought back into the intelligence system. Uh, you find checkpoints, not a lot. You don't see a lot of military, but checkpoints are random and, is, and they're good. People, people, Tunisians appreciate that they're taking place. Uh, so I would say the security measures are, are really quite strong. And probably one of the best measures of that is the first country to raise warnings in any time is always the U.S. And the U.S. took away all warnings about Tunisia in April of 2014. And I was very active in, in lobbying and working with them on these issues. And for them to have finally made that decision is not a decision that came lightly. So I would say it's, it's a country that is secure, safe, um, measures are taken just you know, behind the scene that in tourism, for example, when you check into a hotel, it may seem rather bureaucratic, but they have your name, they, they know what the next place is you're going, and part of that is is because the next day, someone's going to call your tour company and your guide and say, did all 12 of the people show up to the next stop? So there are these behind the scene measures that are, are quietly done. 
and uh, so I, I feel it's a, it's a very safe place. Please. The situation in Morocco and Algeria going good direction or um, The situation in Morocco and Algeria, I've, I've uh, I go to both, and I was just in Morocco a couple of weeks ago. Um, Algeria is uh, Algeria went through a period in the 90s that it, they call their dark years. It was a trauma. Officially, people say 100,000 people were killed. Unofficially, most Algerians will say maybe 200,000 people were killed. It was a period of Islamists versus the rightists. And it was a terrible time. And every Algerian family somehow uh, was captured, you know, knows someone who was caught up in this. It's interesting, when this whole Arab Spring thing happened, the two countries where almost nothing happened were Algeria and Morocco. Algeria for a few couple of Saturdays in Algiers there were minor protests and they soon ended. And I, I, I made three trips this past year to Algeria and I would ask people, they said, we don't have the stomach for it. We've gone through it. And in Morocco, the king knew just what he had to do. He released enough, he, he, he initiated new things into the constitution that said here we're giving some liberties. He, he knew to release the valve enough to do it. And while some people may not like the king, they may think of corruption, but they also say, hey, he's bringing us stability. So I think in both countries, the security situation is, is quite strong. Um, in Algeria, uh, just on the way down here in the car, someone called me about going to Algeria, and I told them that when we plan an itinerary, for example, for Algeria, if we say we wanted to go to the Deep South, the Ministry of Tourism looks at the itinerary in advance, and, today, they will say, you can't go to this particular region. So they're very attuned to security. The last thing any of these countries want is issues. And the Algerians are a very strong military, so there's a zero tolerance for any kind of fifth column Islamic activity today after what happened. But I, I think things have been tempered. Uh, and the fact that nothing resulted in when the rest of the Arab world was having their Arab Spring probably says something about that. We have time for two more. Okay, we're gonna we'll go with, with one of our, another of our students, and we'll come over here. We'll get you back. Are Tunisian women treated equally under the new constitution? Very good question. Tunisian women, not only under the new constitution, since 1956, they were given completely equal rights. Women do not have to ask their husband for a divorce. Women abortion is available. Uh, they. They have complete equal rights. That's why when I gave this example of a few years ago when this Islamic party tried to inject this clause into the Constitution which may have sounded rather benign, saying we'll make women complementary to men, in Saudi Arabia that would have been, wow, this is, this is a, a miraculous uh, progressive uh, you know, opportunity. In Tunisia that would have been a setback. So women and men are completely equal in, in Tunisian society. And you see that also in the professions, in medicine, in law, in academia, people teaching. Women are at an equal level. So it, it's really completely equal by law and, and in practice. Okay, two gentlemen here. Please. Jerry, um, you were contrasting or in the earlier discussion tribalism or you know, sub-segmentation of to the cultural homogeneity and uh, literacy of Tunisia. Right. Um, do you believe that, you know, on the other hand, and, and let me preface, on the other hand, within Islam, there is this concept of the Ummah, you know, that tends to try to bridge across these types of differences. And um, what I'm wondering is, do you believe that it is impossible for to have a genuinely pluralistic democracy within the Arab world, or do you feel that the only way that can ever happen is if somehow the the the, uh, the, the transcendent nature of the tendency toward the Ummah can be somehow harnessed by the Arabs to um, to bridge across these cultural differences and, and have and establish some kind of basis of trust for opposing factions. It's, it's, a, very good, it's a very good question. I'm going to just paraphrase, paraphrase a little bit. The question was, 
under kind of Islamic uh, theory, the Ummah, the, 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 the whole Islamic world together feeling as one, um, to what extent can that really impose or, or impact this idea that I'm, that I'm suggesting has allowed, uh, does, that bu does that buttress what Tunisia has been able to do in a sense of being able to be independent? Uh, can that, as a philosophy in Islam, can that really be an impediment to having a society that's both Islamic and plural, pluralistic and democratic? Uh, it's a very good question because um, the Islamic party during these last three years had a very slick campaign, and they still have it, where they were constantly holding conferences, Islam and democracy, Islam and democracy. And they had some great speakers and you know, coat and tie, perfect English, and they're getting a lot of American support. And these all sound good. But the truth is, from what I, I can't point to one country in the Islamic world that is a pure democracy that's operating under the jurisdiction of Islam. That's not to say you can't have a democracy in an Islamic country. And I think that's what we're now seeing in Tunisia. What, is, what the Islamic party tried to do in Tunisia is kind of put in these Islamic things to give it the character. You know, then the next step, of course, would have been let's give it some Sharia. And the Tunisians have said, we don't need, we're, we're Muslim, we're 99%, we don't need you to tell us how to be a democracy. So I think Tunisia is kind of, again, being an exception. There, I think, there, I think they, you definitely can have a democracy in the Islamic world. I don't think, or at least there hasn't been a proven success yet, of a country that can be a democracy under the jurisdiction of operating as an Islamic. I mean, look at Iran. They had, one would say, they had elections. But the elections were guided by who did the Revolutionary Council say is an eligible person to run. That's not, that's, there, there may be a free part of that democratic process that Iran had, but the choice of it was guided by who did the Revolutionary Council do. So I, I'm skeptical of these nice um, uh, slogans that, that were put forth, and they're, they're, a lot of them are still going on. I think the United States really wanted to, really wanted to see when the revolution happened to see a success. And I think at the beginning they were putting a lot of money into these conferences, hoping this would all work. But I think they've also recognized that it's better to let the democracy be the process, not trying to, to meld Islam and democracy and, and say that they go hand in hand uh, together. Okay. Last question. Thank you for your patience. Yes. Thanks. Uh, on that same. Ability of democracy uh, in a country that has, that's mostly uh, Muslim, like Tunisia, that's yes. talking about. Uh, I believe there is a part in the current uh, otherwise liberal constitution which requires the president of Tunisia to be a Muslim. That's correct. And that's in contrast to the Jewish state of Israel, which does not have the analogous requirement for the president, which in fact uh, was a Muslim not too long ago. Right. And uh, so I'm just wondering. Uh, uh, given that uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, side, side note, uh, is there any uh, vision that that little quark is going to be corrected? Uh, no, the question was, uh, because in the Constitution it says the president is to be a Muslim, is that kind of a little bit of a contradiction to, maybe to what I was uh, just saying? There are so few minorities in Tunisia that I don't think most people care about. And I do, certainly can tell you from the Jewish community, they don't want any more attention than they need. So, so, so no one from the Jewish community is saying, "Hey, we feel left out of this uh, because you 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 limited that we cannot be one of us cannot become president." So I I don't think that is really an issue, and and so much of the character of the country is guided by you know the fact that everyone is Muslim. But I think that was just a concession that no one wanted to fight. And certainly among the small Jewish community, it was the last thing they want to do is say, "Hey, we we want to be part of this big political process." So. So I think it was just, it was put in there and it's benign and no one really cares too much about it. But the, the Jewish community is very, um, you know, they're basically two small communities and they live very well and uh, they're part of the system and they're very Tunisian. And there's some, in the early elections, uh, one candidate ran who actually will, will have a chance to meet on the trip, so. That's the problem. He, he ran in the first elections after the revolution. He didn't win, but. Uh,
but he, he was proud of his Jewish, uh, you know, the fact that he was running as a person who is Jewish. We're going to uh, break for uh, our reception. We have some refreshments in the back. We'll reconvene uh, at 6 o'clock for the sub-Saharan uh, portion of, of our uh, trip through Africa today. And I want to thank Jerry very much. Thank you.